So I'm Ken Coles, if you don't know, and Dr. Bob Blackshaw is right here. And we also have Dr. Mike Harding somewhere, if he's not at this group. Oh, out at the back. We, we've had the, the pleasure of, of working on this rather unique project. Now, this is the third year that we've been involved in the herbicide end. With, uh, with Mike, we've started up a fungicide trial as well. So this was sort of our last opportunity to, to show everybody some of the results that we've been seeing over the last three years. The whole idea sort of stems from the fact that we've got guidance now, we've got high clearance sprayers, we've got low drift nozzles. Our windows of applications have really sort of changed rather dramatically over the last number of years. And so guys are spraying at different times of day, including at night. So we thought, well, a lot of these herbicides were probably registered not at night. Would it be interesting to find out if, because of that expanded spray period, are we seeing differences in efficacy? The trial behind us now is the first attempt that we've had. This is a pre-seed burndown trial. So there's no crops that we've seeded into here, just a natural weed infestation. There are some glyphosate tolerant canola volunteers. We have different timings. This was the first one that we sprayed, and we'll go take a look at the next one they sprayed. It just so happens these ones are very visual this year. Not always did we see the same types of responses, but to be honest with you, the biggest thing that I've come out here is that time of day does make a difference in herbicide efficacy. Do we have it all figured out yet? No, I'm gonna have to take a fair bit of time sorting through our data over the three years and then we have multiple locations as well and try to figure out the true relationships. For the most part, especially in the pre-seed burndown types of situations and certain chemicals, what really surprised me the most is, and, and I've kind of been raised that way too, especially in Southern Alberta, you, you wake up early in the morning and you spray to beat the wind. Turns out that that's actually the worst time to spray. We've been seeing as much as you know, 20% reduction in efficacy, even with glyphosate, things that we think are, are basically bulletproof. Behind me is a really, really visual example of some of the differences that we've seen. So this is carfentrazone, and carfentrazone is the active ingredient in a product called AIM, which is actually tank mixed to have the product, anybody know? Clean Start. So Clean Start is really designed probably to get these volunteer canolas. So if you purchase Clean Start, and this was the results you had, would you be happy? Probably not, hey? In fact, I'd almost consider this my check. This is the difference that we have when we spray it at noon versus at midnight. It's very dramatic. Now, in, in all cases, we don't see this dramatic type of response. How come we see this dramatic response with this particular product? Right. So it's a contact herbicide. Any other reasons what, you know, what, you know, what I wanted to ask Bob is, why is it that contacts don't work at night? I, I, I don't think I know, so. Yeah. I don't think I do either. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe just back up one second, yeah. because I don't have an answer to that question. But just when we think about herbicides working, there's, there's a couple of things that have to happen. And the first one, or maybe three things have to happen. One is you have to have to get good coverage of, of the weed, okay? And that, that may vary with time of day and, uh, and leaf positioning. Some broadleaf weeds, they sort of droop their leaves a little bit at night or late in the day, so they're not quite as, uh, as uh, flat. So your coverage may be a little bit different. And, and of course, we, have, and we fight the wind. The other thing that has to happen is then we have to get absorption of that herbicide into the leaves, into the plant, and and for contact action, maybe that's all that needs to sort of have to happen. But then for our systemic herbicides, they have to get translocated within the plant to the growing point to actually kill kill the wheat, to do the job. So there's <clears throat> sort of two or three sort of important things that, that have to happen, and I think they don't always sort of line up together. So what may be the best conditions for absorption into the plant may not necessarily be the best conditions for translocation of that herbicide in the plant to the growing point. And so I think it's always a bit of a trade-off in conditions. So, um, so just sort of set the stage on some of that stuff. And, you know, back, back to your question, I, I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah. And I don't know if you do either. So. No, I don't. <laughs> in fact, uh, that's why I asked you. Yeah. Did you hear that question, Bob? No, I didn't. Can you repeat that? 
stop taking in more oxygen or breathing more is because feeding that They actually take in carbon dioxide. Part of the day rather yeah, they, they absolutely are. The translocation so is sort of driven by by a growing plant. So herbicides just go for they go along for the ride with with the sugars in the plant. So photosynthesis, the sunlight is creating, that's photosynthesis, the whole thing that creates the sugars, generates the sugars, and then they're moved within the plant. And the herbicide goes along for the ride My point in most is cases. The time of the day, the temperature of the day may be, may be not necessarily the time of the day you sprayed there, but what was the temperature? What was that plant doing? Yeah. Well, exactly. And so the, the, the time of the day when we talk about is really not the time of day, it's the temperature at that time or the relative humidity at that time or the dew at that time or something else at that time so it's the time of day is uh, we're getting all these other conditions associated with the time of day and so what what Ken has to do here uh, in the next year is sort of trying to associate you know whether we get good of good or bad effects with the temperature with the relative humidity and with all the other factors right so yeah. you're very point very very accurate in what you're doing yeah so so I think you need warmer warmer conditions for it to sort of move in the plant. And and I, I guess we'll talk a little bit more as we go along, but I, I think these early spring uh, burn down treatments in April and May, it's just cold. And um, and and our and, and you know, the last five or ten years our springs have even been colder than they were twenty years ago. And so I think we're always sort of fighting this temperature thing and and maybe maybe that's why it's sometimes better in the day than it is other times. Yeah, I think you, you hit on the point for sure. It's 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 not the time of day. It's it's the conditions associated with that time of day. So what what do you think happens in that early morning? And our early morning applications are very early. They're really like between four and five in the morning. What what do you think is going on, condition wise then, that is different than midday, specifically? Yeah, humidity is tends to be the highest at that point. That's either we may have a dew could be ranging from a light dew to a heavy dew. So the dew is going to influence the conditions. It's also the coldest point of the day. Midnight, the temperatures have dropped, but it's certainly not the, the coldest part of the day. If you guys open your booklets to, I think it's page 19, page 20. So page 20 we have, and this is from one of our pre-seed burndown trials, we have plotted the temperature versus the relative humidity. And there's a very direct relationship between temperature and relative humidity under sort of normal weather patterns. So when you have, you see the, I think the red line is the air temperature and the blue line is the relative humidity. So they're almost mere opposites. The three little lines that we put through there, that's the time that we sprayed. And then you can look at how that intersects with the temperature and humidity. And they kind of cross at a certain point and that's usually the nighttime temperature. But in the morning, that's when the temperature is the lowest. And we've dropped down to 7.5 degrees Celsius there. And then the, uh, the relative humidity is in that 70% range. So, so we've got this combination of environmental effects plus the positional, like weeds, some weeds will actually close their leaves down at night just like a flower closes. And in the middle of the day, they open up. So then we have that physical difference of coverage in the types of weeds. A lot of other studies have, have shown that depending on the weed type, they'll see more of a difference in the time of day application. Now to throw a wrench in this sort of nice, even pattern, whenever we've sprayed a trial and there happened to be a rain event near there, this weather pattern sort of breaks down because the humidity is really a lot different when you have that rainfall event. And then we can't quite honestly see that same pattern that we've been seeing and in some, in some instances, a complete reversal of all of the results that we've seen. So it's been kind of challenging from our standpoint to determine what exactly is happening. And, you know, it's a complex biological system. Uh, our trials will take a look over there. This year, we had a little bit of a light rain at our 5 a.m. application. And then for some reason, our daytime applications actually look the worst in this situation. So there is no silver bullet yet. But... Um, we are seeing some significant patterns. I guess some of the take homes are, is that we can see significant differences. If one, you've got a major weed problem like 
you know you have glyphosate tolerant canola that you want to do and you're using a product like Clean Start, it's worth paying attention to. I'm not trying to throw alarms out there like, oh my God, you have to like uh, not sleep at night worrying about what herbicide works under what condition and such, but uh, most of the products work well under many conditions. That's, that's what they, they're designed to do. But there are differences. This is another level of management that I think that we can achieve. And we might be able to come up with uh, some sort of scheduling tips that we might uh, play around with. The other thing is, is that we need to get tied into paying attention to weather conditions, both before and after applications. And there's a lot of great resources out there that, um, that are available. I talk about the ACIS website all the time. ACIS, it's a government, Alberta government website. There's weather stations just littered across this province. And they're working on making it easier to use. And we are as well. We're going we're gonna to launch a new uh, website, basically stealing their information, packaging it up so that it's more practical and usable for farmers. So we tie that in with a little bit of knowledge on, on how some of the different herbicides uh, behave under different weather conditions. Any questions on this one? Let's yeah. almost the opposite extreme. Uh, extreme heat conditions, uh, 30 degrees. It has absolute effect. Yeah, there is. Uh, there's an absolute effect, and maybe I'll let Bob talk about um, some of the other studies that that he originally heard about before we started this project. Yeah, well, this this whole thing goes back about five years ago, and I, I had a few farmers phoning me and um, and asking about spraying at night. And, and because they had GPS technology and they could do that, and they, and they wondered, well, would it be an absolute disaster if they sprayed at night? I mean, that was their, that was their question, really. Would it be terrible? Not, not better. Would it be terrible? And I said, well, really, we haven't done that research. I, I don't know. And so I started reading about it a bit. And, um, you know, and then I talked to Ken, and we, we did demo at the field school here before years ago or five years ago. Yeah. And, and Don Bowles came down, a farmer came down who does this, and we sprayed some things. And, and actually we found out the, that the night spraying was, was not much worse in that case. It was sort of equal. But anyway, I went back and tried to read what some other researchers done, and I found some studies um, from the southern U.S. So Tennessee, Min Mississippi, Georgia, whatever. And they were sort of showing that um, in, in some cases that spraying in the middle of the day uh, when the temperatures were, in their conditions, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, so we're talking 35, 40 degrees Celsius, was a bad time. They, they were not getting good weed control, and in some cases they were even getting crop injury. And it, so it was just, it was too hot. So there is, there is that upper extreme, I think, that happens. And, uh, and their, their conditions, in the, you know, they were getting better conditions by spraying in the cooler part of the day. And usually in the morning was a better was a better time. So, and that may actually be a little bit the same for us if we were spraying in in late June or July, uh, whether that was a herbicide or whether we're going to talk about you know fungicides or insecticides or something. So there there is an upper extreme as well, and so probably things below 10 degrees Celsius are not great, and things above 30 degrees Celsius are not great. So there's probably. A, a sort of a, a happy sort of range in between that. So, uh, and I and honestly, I thought that um, from what I know is that herbicide uptake is generally a little bit better when we have um, cooler conditions. The droplets don't dry down on the leaf surface as quickly. You have more time to penetrate the plant. Um, the cuticle is a little bit hydrated uh, at that time. That's so you got to move through these wax layers, and so there, it's a little easier for all that to happen. And so if I would have made some guesses, I, I would have said that probably that early morning is, is not always going to be better, but it's not going to be worse than the day. So, so I, I was quite surprised by some of these results that, that Ken is getting here in his mm -hmm. work. And, and I think maybe, you know, the extreme of it is, is just the temperature thing that I hadn't thought of too much. And, you know, we're spraying a lot of these burn down treatments at, uh, at, ju at just cold, cold temperatures. Yeah. So, so you spoke on several times today, but you haven't spoke on after, late afternoon and evening, because oftentimes when it goes down, and man, you've got great weather. Yeah. Yeah, we, we don't have that full spread. There are studies that have done that. Uh, I was just reading a paper from Ontario. From what I've seen, I would rather spray at that time than very first thing in the morning from what I've seen so far. So their chart, so what they saw was the early morning, say starting at 6, efficacy would be down here. As it warmed up, it would go like that. It would peak. 
and then it would drop back down a little bit in, in but closer towards midnight and I think that's pretty consistent with what we've seen. So, so Ken, why are we uh, night spraying as it, we can do all those things? Bob, can we not modify the surfactant levels to get to the same uptake levels that you want relative to waxy cuticles, temperature, relative humidity? If we modify the surfactants, could we not get to the same result? Rather than thinking about time, we're thinking then about the plant and the, and the whole goal here is uptake. The herbicide getting in the plant is the key here. So if we modify the surfactant levels up or down, and in my past, that's what you did with some of my actives. So you modify the, the surfactant levels to get the desired effect because the plant, once it gets the surfactant, the uptake will increase, regardless of the temperature, regardless of... Relative. So I think many companies have done a pretty good job with surfactants. I mean, and, there, and maybe you can tweak that from time to time. But the surfactants are out there are, are pretty good. And so I think it's it's uh, the absorption question is probably not as big an issue as it was 20 years ago, because I think in many cases we are getting it in. We're going to talk about dim herbicides later on, and they, they break down in sunlight. And, and actually, Ken is still seeing a bit of a difference maybe, but uh, in most cases we've got around that because we just get the herbicide in the plant within 30 minutes or an hour, and we don't have to worry about that too much. But I think the, the, other, the other component that I already mentioned is it's not just getting into the plant. Maybe we do a pretty good job of that, but then it has to move within the plant. So it has to get to the growing point and all those things that come along. And, and those yeah. environmental conditions maybe are things that, um, that we can't control so much. They're driven by weather, they're driven by temperature, they're driven by other things. Yeah. So, so it's, you know, there's multiple components to that. So. But I, I think most of our surfactants out there are pretty good these days. Uh, and I think we are getting good absorption. Yeah. yeah, and certainly the chemical companies are working on that. I mean, that, that's a competitive advantage. If you can have a product that does work as well in the middle of the, or early morning, uh, whereas a, a competitive product doesn't, I mean, you're going to have less, uh, what is it called, uh, PIs, product complaints. If I was, right now, if I was a, a chemical rep and I was having product complaints, I'd, be, I'd, I'd still be paying attention to exactly when it was sprayed and what those environmental conditions were. So, yeah, that, we can't uh, help them to do that, but I'm pretty confident that they are working towards those types of, uh, types of products. But of course, you know, they also have product lines that they're trying to spray across entire countries. And, you know, what is it about Southern Alberta that we're supposedly in, in as far as a climate range? I've always heard it's called a semi-arid Southern Alberta. Haven't seen it in the last six years, but that an attribute of that type of climate is that we we do get the very cold nights, and I think that's why we have even some of the industries here that that thrive on the cooler nighttime temperatures to fix more sugars in some of the sweet you know like sweet corn and carrots and stuff like that. So, anyways, let's uh, we're gonna walk around to the next side to get you moving and look at a few more things. Product that Carfentrazone product, but then. We were spraying this one about two weeks later, and what happens in that situation is the weeds are a little bit bigger, and we, we're talking about a contact herbicide, but we also know that carfentrazone is really, it's only effective at, at a certain growth stage, and once that volunteer canola gets a little bit bigger, it has a harder time in controlling it. We think of that in a tank mix. That's the only tank mix partner that's actually having an effect on this. I think the, it'd be a similar situation with our glyphosate tolerant uh, kochia, although in looking at Bob's plot, the glyphosate actually does still have activity on some of the resistance stuff, but, but you're, you're, you're relying now on a tank partner to do a job. So if there are differences like this, then we probably want to know about them, and they're pretty serious situations. In this case, uh, I don't think that we, we still see the difference. This is the midnight here versus our midday there, but overall, I don't think the level of control on the canola is as good. So that's when we move down to just the glyphosate alone. These studies I didn't mention, we removed the tank partners so that we would have an idea of differences on the mode of action themselves. I understand that you'd be applying these applications together, but it was a sort of important for us to, to pick them out, find out are there are certain chemistries, certain modes of action that, that have an effect more than others, and I think that is the case. But uh, these ones are separate. The first trial, we actually did reduce the rates. We were at a three-quarter rate. And the reason we did that was we wanted to sort of push the extremes, see if there are differences. 
This case, it was the full label rate, but the weeds were a little bit bigger. So come on down and take a look at the glyphosate now. This year, this was sprayed a little bit later. The temperatures are a little bit warmer. Uh, what we do see is that glyphosate does most of the work in your burn down. I think you all know that. What is that one there? That's our pre-pass. I think that we look at that early morning treatment. Do you, do you guys think this one looks worse than the other two? You can still see it, hey? Now this isn't the most extreme case, but this one's actually been pretty consistent with glyphosate in the burn down trials, and even in uh, a number of occasions in our in-crop studies. So, so I, uh, and, and that, this one is pretty consistent with a couple of papers that I've read, that early morning glyphosate application is a little bit less effective. This is just pre-passed by itself, just the fluorazolam. Yeah, that's pre -pass. Yeah. Any questions on the burn down side of things? Okay, let's keep rolling. We'll take a look at our in-crop studies now. Okay. So I wasn't, um, I wasn't actually planning on showing this plot, which is why we don't have it staked, but it was actually only sprayed a day and a half ago. And we, we had planned on spraying this a little bit earlier because it would work better for our our tour purposes, but we had that seven inches of rain last week that kind of messed things up for us. But come in and take a look here. You see something going on right where I'm standing here? So this was Liberty sprayed it in the day. Right here. This is, what does this one say? This is the early morning Liberty, and that would be the night Liberty. Can you guys see that? Like after one day, that kind of blows my mind to be honest with you. What we have seen generally speaking over the course of the study was that the differences that we saw were bigger the sooner after the application we did the evaluation. On this case, we have our mustard is a tame mustard that we seeded in the front and in the back it's a tame oats and then we've seeded crops perpendicular to that. So then we have a very even weed stand to do our evaluations. When we're using uh, natural populations that adds uh, variability to it so I'm, I like this design. We'll do visual ratings but then we also go in there and do biomass. So we'll throw down our quarter meter squares. That becomes a quantitative measure of the results and we'll separate out the weeds from the crop and have a good idea of the actual amount of weed produced. And at that biomass sampling point is usually about three to four weeks after, after application. Maybe this is a good point to sort of talk about um, how the weeds were dying and quantitative versus qualitative. Well, I guess we had a question yesterday about sort of how, how we evaluate this and, and as Ken said we, he goes in and, and does visual ratings all the time and they, they can actually be you can get very good at that after a while if you do it years after years after years but but it's sort of there's a level of bias that comes into play and so if I if I want that that new treatment to look better I can almost unconsciously give it a 10% higher rating and I don't even really know I'm doing it and so because it's a subjective thing and, and we all we all have sort of biases going in we, we have some guesses of how this is going to look before we even set up the experiment and then we go in and we're sort of hoping it's going to look like that often I find the results are exact opposite of what I guessed it was going to be before I start so <clears throat> I sort of have to eat humble pie all the time and say I was 100% wrong and this is the way it is but so we do that but it really we, we want sort of a, a quantitative measure to sort of avoid the bias all the time as well. So that's why we're always interested in a weed biomass or crop yield data. So that those are hard numbers that, that we can't, you know, we can't, uh, you know, there's, we're, they're unbiased. We can't fudge those numbers anyway. We go in, we take a sample, and we weigh that sample, and that's the real number. And so, and the biomass is a great integrator of the number of weeds and the size of the weeds. So you could have a hundred small green foxtail that are only three inches tall and they're not really going to compete very much and then you could have ten wild mustard plants that were four feet tall that would be competing a lot so weed numbers 
really don't tell you much of a story in terms of uh, wheat competition, crop yield loss, or even how much wheat seed is going to be produced for the next year. So, so we found over the years that wheat biomass is a great integrator of the number of weeds and the size of the weeds. So, uh, so Ken's crew will come in here after that and take wheat biomass. And, um, like I say, and then, then, we, and then it's a better value of terms to do statistics on as well. So we're always trying to determine was this, uh, was this effect really due to the treatment or was it just due to random variation in the experiment? Um, so it helps us do all those things, I guess, in terms of biomass. Have you ever looked at using NDVI images to get a vegetative index for biomass? Usually, I know you would have these larger scales. No, we use them in the plots. Yeah. We, we, we do have a, a green seeker, and we, we do NDVI measurements on a number of our trials. And what it ends up being is, it, it's another piece of information that might sort of correlate with, say, a biomass or something like that. It's not, uh, it's not completely useful in, in, in any other sense than that at this point, but yeah, we, we play around. It can be quite yeah. useful on a crop or a monoculture. Yeah. We have a weed and a crop here, so if we just take that measurement, we're measuring the weed and yeah. the crop together, right? Yeah. So we, we want we want them separate. Fertility trials we they, want, they work. We want a weed biomass yeah. and then we also want a crop biomass. So yeah. so there's no good way right now to separate those yep. without actually destructively taking yeah. samples and separating them. So page page twenty one actually there's two trials where they, these were the greatest uh, differences that we saw in yield was was this liberty, this type of effect here that we're looking at. And and in twenty twelve uh, we went from 29 bushels sprayed at night to 45 bushels in the day, and that was a $200 per acre hit just by when you sprayed a, a crop. So those types of stories are, are just once in a while, but still such an extreme that I think that it's important that people are aware of it. And then in 2013, we went from 50 to 60 bushels. Like that's Those are real numbers. I mean, we have a lot of guys playing around with with seed primers and this and that that don't tend to have any yield effect when uh, when you could be paying attention to things that actually pay the bills. And to the right of that, Bob talked about biomass and, and this is one in particular with that, uh, that dim herbicide. This one was select in peas. So the bigger the number means the more weight of weed in that case. And our daytime in that case was the worst by quite a bit. It was actually 100% more than our nighttime application. And that sort of goes in line with what Bob was talking about. You know, we didn't really expect to see that types of results because we assumed surfactants were doing its job. We have to still keep in mind these are extreme situations. Again, we probably have cut rates on, we had cut rates on that particular trial so that we could see the differences. Generally speaking, I do feel like there's not a lot to worry about. We did this study in canola, Liberty, and Roundup, in peas, and in wheat. And if I had to come up with a general rule of thumb, the wheat herbicides tend to seem to work the best under most conditions. So if I was forced to get up early in the morning and spray, I'd probably spray my wheats. The midday, that's when I'd be doing my Liberty and my Roundup canolas. And then that evening spray, like we were talking about earlier, 9 o'clock type thing, that's likely when I would be spraying my peas. Now, it's not a perfect rule of thumb, it's just sort of some generalizations that I pulled out, but some, you know, something that at least you can have in the back of your mind. Maybe you've got a, wheel, a, a field that you know has really bad volunteer canola, or a super high weed density, or some really hard to kill weeds. Those are the types of situations I might be paying a little more attention to when I'm spraying. Um, so we've talked about the pre-seed burn down, you know, that's earlier in the season. Now our in crops, a little bit later, the temperature and weather starting to change. I'm going to have Mike Harding talk briefly about our fungicide trials now, because that ends up putting us into a yet another environment. A little bit later in the season, the weather's starting to get a lot hotter. So where is Mike? Here we are. What do you want, how much time? Five minutes. Okay. <laughs> so when I heard about the night spraying herbicide, trial that Ken was doing and when he called to talk to me about the fungicides I thought Sorry. is Ken an insomniac like why does he want to always be spraying stuff at midnight 
But it turns out he's not an insomniac. He just likes to get his people to come out at midnight and do the work. Oh, I spray him. too. <laughs> come on. Still have a baby in the um, the first Three thing I'd like kids. To do yeah. Since I have limited time, is I have a couple of books uh, regarding uh, diseases and uh, in crops in Canada, and I have a couple of hand lenses. So. Anybody interested, anybody who's scouting crops, like a grower or a crop scout that's interested in a book and a hand lens? Yeah. Yeah? That was easy, eh? Okay. Okay. That's awesome. I got, I got one book left. Actually, okay, it's cool. So I had to answer that's a good Thanks book. Going forward oh. We did yesterday, but he... Okay, night spring of fungicides. <laughs> if you turn to page 19 in the book, like I, should share. Uh, I guess I'll cut to the chase here and give you the punchline. It's still a little early in the game for us. We only have one year of data for the night spring, and, and we're seeing some potentially some trends, but we don't really have any major conclusions yet. But I've included in this handout something that is known about fungicides that was done in the southern U.S. So in Georgia on peanuts. I know we don't grow peanuts here, and I know this is the southern United States, but the principles we can, that we know about <laughs> fungicides at night are shown here. So if you look in the graph A, you'll see a dark black box, a diagonally hatched box, and then double diagonal hatched. So the left one, the black one, is sprayed at night. The diagonal is at day, and then the double diagonal is no treatment. And that upper box is the level of rust severity. So rust is a disease that occurs in the upper canopy, and they, what they saw was that when they sprayed a fungicide, they got a response to lower disease, but it didn't matter if they sprayed it at day or night. There's no difference. Now look at B. So this is stem rot on peanuts, and it's caused by sclerotinia. It's a closely related sclerotinia to the one we have in canola and other crops here. And look at the difference. When they spray at night, they see a significant reduction compared to when they spray in the day. So why is that? Well, there's a couple of potential reasons. I'm going to show you this picture first. And this is a pretty big group, so maybe I'll just have you pass it around. If you look at a peanut canopy early in the morning, the leaves are all curled up. You can see bare ground. Whereas in the daytime, in the heat of the day, the canopy's out intercepting sunlight. So if you spray in the daytime, you're going to hit the upper canopy. If you spray at night, you're going to have much deeper penetration into the canopy. In addition to that, there might be a higher humidity. I'm not sure that's true in Georgia. It's pretty humid there all the time. But here you have a higher humidity at that early morning time or at night, and that would help redistribute the fungicide along the leaf and also down deeper into the canopy. So the, in some cases, the time of day, and as we mentioned before, it may not be time of day. It may just be environmental conditions. So temperature, relative humidity, incidence of light, etc. These can affect the canopy of the crop and can affect the redistribution of the fungicide within the canopy. So if you were trying to control, so in the, in the study now, what we're doing in Alberta here is listed at the bottom. We've got four crops, canola, wheat, barley, and peas. And we're trying to control sclerotinia and canola, the leaf lesion complex in cereals, and mycosporelli and peas. So for two of these diseases, for two of these crops, the leaf lesion complex, where do we want our fungicides to manage disease and control yield? Do we want them in the upper canopy or lower? Yeah. For cereal leaf diseases, we want to protect what part of the canopy? Upper. upper. We want to protect the flag, the head, etc. That's what's going to fill the head, right? That's where the photosynthetic potential is to fill the head. So we want to protect against disease up there. What about sclerotinia and canola and mycosporella? Where do those diseases oftentimes do their, their work, their worst work? Stem. Down low in the canopy on the stem. So redistribution of the fungicide, helping it get down into the lower canopy may be a benefit. And in the first year, we saw a response, the, the biggest response we saw for spraying at night, when the temperature is lower and the yeah. humidity is higher, the greatest difference we saw was in peas. We actually saw a yield response in the first year. We also saw maybe some response in barley. Um, and again, as I mentioned, it's pretty early on to really make any conclusions or sort of make any life-changing decisions based on what we found. But it looks like for fungicides, those environmental conditions that are generally associated with the you know, heat of the day as opposed to midnight or early in the morning can have an effect on how efficacious the fungicide application is. Thanks.
stem infections. So whether that's an increased water volume, uh, you know, we don't really know if spraying at night or early in the morning makes a difference because we haven't tested it. But for sure, that's the target is to get the crop, get the fungicide down to where the, mm. you know, the, where we want to protect. So you repeat that same thing with these then take. Yeah, you definitely want to get your fungicide to the target, which in for peas and my cosprella and peas, you want to really prevent against those main stem infections that are going to cause logging late in the season. And for beans, a main stem infection with sclerotinia is 100% yield loss essentially. In beans, actually, I, I saw a field because we were working in a project on a on a biofungicide. A, a farmer was sprayed till till the evening, stopped, finished up in the morning and there was a perfect line of difference between the control and the white mold. I suspect it was the early morning that was better, but I honestly can't remember it was so many years, but I just remember seeing that effect thinking, man, we got to look into this a little more closely.